Yeah, during this election to say none of the candidates are talking about the drug epidemic. I've been saying it for months. I had a great former DEA agent on this show about a month ago, Michael Levine, to prove what I'm saying to you. Now, all of a sudden, Obama is including $1.1 billion in mandatory funding to expand access to treatment for prescription drug and heroin abuse. That's wonderful, but that's not going to solve the problem. Everyone knows that. That's just throwing money at the problem. That's not going to solve the heroin addiction and other prescription drug problem at all. It's not going to solve it at all. It's going to just have people hold their hands and tell them that they're all victims for using drugs. And you and I both know what, what the recidivism rate is for those who go into treatment. How many of them go back to using drugs the minute they get out of treatment? What's the percentage? Do you know the answer? It's nonsense. And if you look at the boards of directors of treatment facilities, especially the national uh, treatment facility organizations, you'll see a weird crossover in directorships of those on pharmaceutical boards. By the way, do I have to point it out to you any more clearly what's going on in the country? So I want to talk about the drug addiction in New Hampshire. I want to talk about... Um, um, Zika virus and how it's related to Rift Valley fever, Wamba fever, West Nile, Mango, same leaky forest fever, Bunyamwera, Nataya, Uganda S, because they're all related. They all come out of Africa in the same area. Uh, fortunately for you, when I was a younger scientist, one of my best friends was an expert on tropical medicine. He's since passed away. He's one of the great geniuses on uh, tropical medicine. And he would talk with me about these late until the night. We'd be drinking beer, and he'd tell me about all of the differences between these diseases. And you'll say, well, who cares about it? Well, what, what do you care about? The poll numbers in New Hampshire? That's all you want to hear? Go read it on the Drudge Report, a real clear politics. You're listening to radio. You know what the first word of this radio show is? Talk. Why is it called talk radio? Because it's about talk. Not about just giving you facts and information. You can get that in a thousand different places. But if you have the ability to formulate thoughts and put them together in a cogent form, then you are a talk radio host extraordinaire. When I come back, the World Socialist website, who hates Bernie Sanders, and why the World Socialist website hates Bernie Sanders. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE-SAVAGE. This bring and get high Bernie Sanders campaign slogan for New Hampshire. Everything's free. Just stay high and vote for me. Yeah, it'd be a laughing matter if it wasn't a tragic matter. They're addicted to heroin. They're addicted to fentanyl. Now, you and I both know that if we had a federal government that wanted the drug addiction to stop, it could be stopped in a very short period of time. We know that. The federal government can crack down on a few ranchers who protest on a ranch in Oregon and shoot one of them dead in the street and get away with it. But they let drug dealers run wild in the streets of America. In fact, they let drug dealers run so wild in the streets that National Geographic Television is uh, glorifying them with a series called Drugs, Inc. They put on ski masks and tell you how they're selling it and the way they're going and how much they get. Turn them into heroes like Robin Hoods. Drug dealers are heroes to the National Geographic Channel. It's astounding. And you say, oh, there's a drug epidemic. Well, there is, but the federal government is behind it. Directly and indirectly, in my opinion. But let's talk about New Hampshire. New Hampshire was once a rock rib, rock rib Republican state. When you said New Hampshire, you thought of a white guy with a, with a, um, I can't even think of the tool. I haven't used one in about 55,000 years. What you stick, I almost said a fork, but what's a fork that you put in the ground? I swear to God, I can't remember the name of the tool. I don't use those tools. I don't have a, I have a hoe in my garage for beating away rodents, but I don't know what it's called. You know what you stick in the ground with hay? It's got five fingers on it. Pitchfork. You think of New Hampshire. The image that came up was a guy in Oshkosh Pagosh with a pitchfork with a long face, with a wife that looks the same way. Looks like Megyn Kelly will look in a few more years if she keeps it up. That's what you think. We say New Hampshire, you think of that kind of look. It's not that anymore. Think of a, jug, a junkie writhing on a dirty mattress somewhere in a, in a filthy motel room. That's Bernie Sanders' uh, popularity in a nutshell. And you think, I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. The college students, what, they're, they're above that? What do they live for today in a college? What do they go for? To become a rocket engineer, nuclear scientist, save the world, go to Africa and save the poor? That's not what they're going to college for. They're going for drugs, sex, and rock and roll. That's all. So you got heroin, you got fentanyl. 
Fentanyl is another product of the, of the pharmaceutical uh, geniuses. Powerful synthetic opiate. Uh, more potent than morphine. It's given to patients to treat uh, people with severe pain or to manage pain after surgery. Fine, it works very well. It's also given to people with chronic pain who are physically tolerant to opiates. It is a Schedule II prescription drug. I'm talking about fentanyl right now. In its prescription form, you may have some in your cabinet called uh, Actic, Duragesic, Sublimase. If you're buying it off the street, it's known as Apache, China Girl, China White, Dance Fever, Friend, Godfella, Goodfella, Jackpot, Murder A, TNT, as well as Tango and Cash. How does it work? Fentanyl works by binding to the body's opiate receptors, which are highly concentrated in areas of the brain that control pain and emotions. The body's opiate receptors are highly concentrated in areas of the brain that control both pain and emotions. Let me explain why that's so important. Well, we know it kills pain, but it also does what? It kills emotions, which is why I have a nation of zombies. A nation of idiots that would let this clown in the White House get away with anything. And now enters from, from stage far left, the street radical, Bernie Sanders, a left-wing fanatic from the get-go. Came out of the womb a left-wing fanatic. Never in human history could a man like him appeal to them unless they were stoned and their emotions were killed with drugs. And when opiate drugs bind to these opiate receptors, they drive up dopamine levels in the brain's reward areas. And that produces a state of euphoria and relaxation. It's called getting high, right? Live free and get high. Now, there are medications that are called opiate receptor antagonists, which actually act by blocking the effects of opiate drugs. Naloxone is one such antagonist. And if they overdose on fentanyl, they treat them. The poor doctors that work in emergency rooms have to shoot them up with naloxone. The fact of the matter is there are other treatments for uh, uh, addiction other than sitting and letting them hold hands and, and, and talk about their life's problems, by the way. But we'll go into that another form, uh, another day. Now, what's even worse is that they're mixing fentanyl with street-sold heroin or cocaine because it markedly amplifies the potency and potential dangers of all three of them. And that's when you wind up with addiction, sometimes uh, death. Now, I didn't get back to my primary show topic today. My theme was why I'm not a socialist. I could also say why I'm, why I'm not a drug addict, because I think they're one and the same. But that's a second story. I think that a high degree of drug addicts would be socialists, because a socialist promises them no punishment and just basically free drugs and treatment. No punishment whatsoever for their bad behavior. Instead, instead of being seen as a criminal, to Bernie Sanders, they're being seen as what? A poor, misunderstood patient who needs treatment, and they treat themselves with a street medication called heroin. I've heard that my whole life. The junkie says, I'm sick, I need my medicine, and they call heroin or fentanyl their medicine, or they call cocaine their medicine, or the sex addict says he uses sex as his medicine. This is a new thing in American society. There are no longer any bad people. Everyone's equal. Some are more equal than others. And the more sick you are and the weaker you are, the more equal you are to the Democrat socialist machine. But that's a secondary story. You know, I got so many calls right now on this topic that I may as well start with the calls and then I'll go back to a little bit of why I am not a socialist. It's a very important topic. Given my background as an immigrant son, as I said to you earlier, I think I'm going to do, do that right now before I take the, the uh, junkie calls. Given the fact that I come from a poor immigrant family and I grew up in a left-wing environment, you would think that I would be a lifetime left-winger, right? But I'm not a lifetime left-winger. Why did I become who I am and when did it happen? Well, I became cauterized because once I became ambitious and wanted to make something of myself, every impediment was thrown in my way that you could imagine. First, because of my race, I was blocked from my chosen profession. You see, I was not a minority, and I was not a woman, and I was not an immigrant, and so I was blocked from my chosen profession. Otherwise, I might have become a very happy college teacher, and like the rest of the uh, leeches called college teachers, which is by and large true for 90% or more of them, they do absolutely nothing but collect a fat check 
and moan and groan about how bad American capitalism is. And they're the largest block of supporters for this loser from New York, Bernie Sanders. Please don't call me and say you're a teacher and a college teacher and you're not a, you're not a liberal. I get it. About 10% of you are not like that. 90% of you are. It's basically a, gi a gigantic brainwashing academy to destroy our, 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 our youth with, with, the, with the hatred and the lies. So I probably would have been one of them. Happily hanging around. I'd be long retired by now. I'd have all of my friends with the berets marching around, talking about how evil America is and how horrible Donald Trump is and how illiterate Donald Trump is and how brilliant Hillary Clinton is and how wonderful Bernie Sanders is. But you see, that, that changed for me a long time ago, maybe 40 years ago, because I evolved. And most of my cohorts have not evolved. They stayed in New York, and they stayed not only in New York, but they stayed in the ghettos of their own mind. They got trapped in the ghettos of their own mind with the rhetoric of the 1960s, which goes back to the 1930s, which goes back to the 1880s, and there's nothing new under the sun for them. They've seen it all, they've heard it all, they're all cynical and they know everything. And the anomaly here is that you see a billionaire like Larry David, a billionaire, remember, he made a billion dollars or more on this Seinfeld series, and yet he espouses socialism. And he masks himself as a socialist, as many of those from that menu do. Hollywood is filled with them. Harvey Weinstein, David Geffen, uh, Hatzenberg, Katzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg. They pretend that they're all fanat fanatical left-wing guys. They're worth billions of dollars. How does that work? How does it work that they want more taxes and more restrictions? How does that work? Because they're liars through and through. That's how it works, in my opinion. But that's a secondary story. The question is, why am I not a socialist? How did it happen that I, from that menu, broke free of the ghetto of my own mind? That's a very important question. I don't know if you're interested in it, and I may or may not get back to it uh, in this show, but I will do it at another time. I think what you want to do is talk about uh, the, the election for sure in New Hampshire. We'll have the results flowing in. It's already almost a quarter to four in New Hampshire, so you know... They pretty much know what's happening already with the marching in there with the snow and the, and the, and the pitchforks. And the results haven't changed very much. Trump is tr trouncing everybody, and Cruz slipped to third or fourth place. Is that right? Still holding in the same place? Even old sad sack Kasich has beaten Cruz, beating Cruz so far over there in New Hampshire. Now, again, it's not, it's, I'll, I'll stick to what I said uh, last week. It's an anomaly. New Hampshire as Iowa is an anomaly. It is not representative of the entire country demographically or any other way. But okay, it's an interesting thing to discuss if you want to get all excited about it. I'd rather talk about heroin addiction in New Hampshire and why the federal government is not doing anything about it. And I'd like to talk about why I am the only person in the media who talked about this long before anybody else had made it a subject, by the way, for the uh, presidential election. Yes, I take credit for that. I, Michael Savage, made drug addiction a subject for this presidential election. Nobody else did this until I did it. WJR, Eric, welcome to the program. Fire away, 30 seconds or less. Yeah, Dr. Savage, uh, I come from a, a pretty small town here in Michigan, and I grew up in the Detroit area, moved to that small town, and I graduated from a class of 150 people, and they, I know of at least four or five people who have died of heroin overdoses in just that small town in America. This is not indiscriminate. It goes anywhere and against any socioeconomic class. It is a problem, and it is directly tied to open borders, which is directly tied to our federal government and competence. Okay, so spell it out for the idiots in the audience. How is it tied to open borders? Because that's where the drugs are coming across. And not only that's where the drugs are coming across, but there's multiple documented cases where people who are coming across with their own free volition will be stopped by the cartels and said, hey, you want to go any further? Guess what? Put this sack on your back and hike 100 miles through the desert. Okay, so who started the open border uh, scourge on America? Who did it? You know, Dr. Savage, I'm not sure. I'm not uneducated enough. I'm well, I'll make it real simple for you. Bill Clinton started it with NAFTA, and George Bush finished it with six highways from Mexico into the United States where trucks could come in unex unexpected. Did you know that the Bush family did that? Did you know anything about that? I'm not at all surprised. Oh, no, no. No one remembers anything anymore. Yeah, old Bush. And I was on talk radio in the 90s. I remember when Clinton passed NAFTA. I, I was talking about this. I was talking about the great sucking sound going south. Then a, along comes Bush, and he starts pushing the open highways from Mexico. People saying, are you crazy? You're going to let trucks come across the border without any screening by the Border Patrol? 
That was called a Republican. So you tell me there's not a one-party system?